We are recording, and John, I'm going to go on mute, and it's all you. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, it's John Lively, everybody, and uh, I'm, this is part two of my <clears throat> fly tying uh, class on Cayuta Creek flies. Yeah, I assume everybody tonight was on the first one, and uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through these slides all over again. <clears throat> if you are just joining the, the class, you couldn't make the first one for whatever reason. I think these are going to be available somehow. Um, Matt or Kirk or somebody will have the details on that. So uh, let me dive in. The, uh, I went over these last, the first week, we, and I demonstrated the uh, Hendrickson <coughs> soft tackle. I demonstrated the Hendrickson emerger, the variation that I uh, tie and use. And I also demonstrated at the end, <coughs> my uh, talked about early season streamers and the damsel nymph fly, which is kind of my universal all purpose catch anything fly. So what I did not cover were two of the <coughs> uh, most fun, in my opinion, fun flies to fish, which are the stone flies and the caddis flies. And the, the reason I think they're fun to fish is that um, unlike a lot of mayflies, you don't have to have a dead drift to fish these flies. And in fact, uh, both stoneflies and caddisflies when they're hatching are so alive with movement that it often pays off to impart some motion to the flies as they're drifting. And you know, so you can dead drift with a twitch or you can swing like a soft tackle, depending on the fly. And uh, it makes it so much fun when you twitch it and the fish comes out of nowhere and blasts it. <clears throat> so uh, of the three caddis flies here on the screen, I've got a dry fly, uh, an emerger, and uh, what Gary LaFontaine calls a deep sparkle emerger, which is a beadhead, you know, nymph basically. <clears throat> so from left, from right to left, you know, one is fished on the surface, uh, high on the surface. You could even, to the point of even being able to skitter it or bounce it around. And the middle fly is fished near the surface or in the film. And the third fly is fished below the surface, you know, two feet, four feet, two, two, two to four feet down typically on, uh, on our local streams. Uh, these are all dressed in uh, the black gray uh, color variation, which is very common on our, our streams. They, they have in common uh, black body, black hackle and tan uh, accents. And this, this hatch, these black caddis hatch oftentimes coincident with the Hendrickson's. You could have both of them hatching at the very same time and the fish are on one and not the other. Or you could go out expecting a Hen Hendrickson hatch and the Hendrickson hatch doesn't happen, but the black caddis start coming off instead. So it really pays off to have both uh, Hendrickson and Black Caddis in your in your box um, around that time, and, and that's uh, you know anywhere from depending on the spring, mid March to mid May, and then some, somewhere in that window there'll be a period of a couple weeks where it's uh, it's really good. All right, so I'm going to start on the the. The deer hair, I just call it, it's like an elk hair caddis, but I tie it with deer hair. Um, so one of the techniques that's involved here is uh, working, making a deer hair wing. I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, on the next fly, the sparkly merger, uh, what's a little bit different about that one is that it uses Antron yarn as an envelope or a veil 
around the fly to simulate an air bubble. And so that's, and, and that's unusual. And it takes a while to, to kind of figure out how to make that form properly. So I'll, you'll be learning, <clears throat> I'll be demonstrating, you'll be learning uh, how to tie that with this fly. And then on this one, it's sort of still using the veil material. Um, so there's that, but I also add a little twist to get the body on, which uh, is kind of kind of different. And then on the skittering stones, the, the technique here is palmering the hackle from uh, from the from the back to the front of the fly versus just tying a collar in. And on the sunken stone, this is a variation of a soft hackle. Uh, and what's different about this particular variation is it has a wing. Um, and the hackle is not a collar, it's tied, again, Palmer style uh, to emulate weight, legs that are hanging down under the fly. So that's kind of a preview of uh, what I'm going to attempt to cover tonight. And I'll start with this uh, deer hair caddis. So as I tie each fly, I'm going to switch to the second camera view, <clears throat> which is uh, provided courtesy of a brand new cam that the club bought. And it works really well, at least it has in uh, practice here, much better than the iPhone. And uh, I'm, I'm confident we're not gonna have any network glitches or anything because it's plugged into my computer with a cord. Uh, so it's hard, hardwired into the laptop, so to speak. This is just a fly to test the uh, camera focus and everything. So I'll get rid of that and we'll start in on the black caddis. So the materials for this fly, that, that's on the, uh, the PowerPoint, but it's a, a standard dry fly hook, TMC 100 or equivalent, size 14 or 16. So that's, uh, I practiced doing this, where is it? That's a little, oh, oh yeah, because I'm, I'm over there. Okay, TMC 100 is the standard Tiemco dry fly. Uh, 1X fine, wide gap, down eye, standard dry fly hook. And I've got one here. So we'll put that on the, in the vise. Oops. I'm going to get my my visor on. I think I mentioned this before, these visors are really uh, extremely helpful when you get to be a certain age. And I'm going to use black thread. This is a six aught uni thread. So I'm starting the uh, starting in here. If at any time while I'm tying, I bump the can't bump the vise or I'm putting my hand in front of the camera anything that obstructs your, your view, say something and I'll, I'll remedy that. All right, so I'm gonna to go to the back of the fly and just let that dangle for a minute, cut off that excess. So there's really uh, two things that are gonna happen here. I'm gonna put, put some dubbing on the hook and I'm gonna put some hackle on the hook. The dubbing goes forward first and then it's followed by the hackle. So they both have to be tied in now. Um, here is the, yeah, over here. Uh, this is the piece of hackle I'm going to be selecting a feather from. It's, it's a neck um, that I, I took some of <clears throat> and dyed it black. It's really hard to get black uh, hackle it's very easy to take like a grizzly hackle and get some black hair dye. Uh, I think Ray Gradner used to use nice and easy. It's like seven bucks at uh, Target. And uh, you can dye as much hackle. It works on deer hair. Um, and then to select a feather, you know, <clears throat> you have to um, look at the length of the barbs. So I'm, I'm isolating a feather here. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. 
So there's the barbs and they're going to stick down right about to the bottom of the, the bend of the hook. Can't see that too well, but you can see the top of it anyway. Um, so that's a good size. I don't really know it came off, so that's karma. I'm uh, and that's that's a really good good dry fly heckle. There's not a lot of fuzzy feathers or anything up up at the end, so just gonna so I'm peeling off a bit at the front, and then uh, I might use that much. I'm certainly not going to use, I mean, this feather is like uh, 12 feet, 12 inches long. I'm certainly not going to use that much. So I'm just going to cut off what I need and maybe a little extra because you never know. All right. And, and you know, another thing is that the barbs get a little bit longer towards towards the front of the feather. So I'm going to tie it in by the tip and and then when I wrap it forward, the barbs will get just a little bit longer toward the front, which I don't know how much that matters, but you know, this is what we're gonna do. All right, so, oh, that's better, isn't it? Here, how's that, that, that a little better? Oh, that's great. Yeah, so, let me back up. So I'm measuring the, uh, the barbs there against the, the hook. And then I'm going to tie it in by the tip. A couple of wraps, you don't have to go crazy. Three wraps. I'm trimming off the end here. And because I only did a couple of wraps and I'm not tying a knot or anything, I am going to give it a little a tiny little shot of Zaffigaf medium uh, crazy glue. And as before, the, the way I, I do this is I use a, a bodkin. I need and I'm just going to put a drop on that, a very small drop, part of the drop. And I'm just going to touch it on there. It's really, and that's too much even. And that's all I need. Now, the other thing that has to happen is I need to put a little dubbing on there. <clears throat> The dubbing I'm using is super fine dubbing black from Pinewood Flies. Uh, any any black dry fly dubbing will work. And then to um, I'm going to use a tiny bit of wax on there. Dubbing wax is can be really messy. This is what the end of my wax stick looks like. All these little strings and stuff come off of it. <clears throat> I'm just going to touch it, you know, carefully to the, uh, the thread. I'm not going to smear a whole lot on there. And then, um, maybe if I back up just a little bit there. So then I'm just gonna I call it touch dubbing. You just touch the dubbing to the thread and it kind of sticks on the on the thread. This is very um, has long fibers, so it's kind of not doing that, but basically spread it along the thread, give it a twist. I'm twisting in opposite directions with my two fingers. So there's my thread with the dubbing on it, okay? So now I've got my dubbing and I've got my uh, hackle on. I'm gonna put the 
you want the dubbing up the hook. Just wrapping and wrapping. And I'm going to be careful not to go too far. If I go too far forward, I'm going to have to, it would be difficult to mount all the deer hair on top of all the dubbing and finish off the hackle and everything. So I'm not going to go all the way up. I'm going to leave a good good flat space in the front there, like so. I'm going to put a half inch in, just to lock the thread, keep it from unraveling. Hang that off of my thread hanger, and now we're going to wrap the So I, I don't know if you can see that, I have my uh, Radio Shack hackle pliers here. I grab the end of the, the end of the hackle in the pliers and I'm using the vise. You can see over here. Um, and I'm just going to rotate this slowly, being very careful, watching how the fibers lay on the, <coughs> on the shank and everything. And to the extent you can, you kind of you can brush them back with your fingers as you go. And I'm, I've got my finger right on the right on the hook here as it, and as I'm rolling the rotating the vise, and it's fairly taut. I'm just trying to keep it under control here. All right, and again, I'm going to stop before I get to the front. Okay. I'm going to stop right about there. So I'm just holding holding the feather up, and I'm coming across the stem, putting it putting the thread down, and another wrap down. So I have two wraps over the. You see that? Yeah, let me go this way. Whoops. No. Come on. Come on. Come on. It'll pop into focus, I'm sure. Come on. Not to. Hey, John, I believe that there's a focus wheel on the front of the camera. You could try rolling that. Uh, there, it's back, right? Yeah, it's back. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think I did anything particularly. Oop, that did it, right? Yeah. There, we're back. I'm not touching it. All right. I got I got three wraps behind behind the hackle now between the so on this side of the hackle, right, over here. I'm going to come up on the other side now, the front, with one or two turns. I'm going to go back over one more time, and that's, I'm going to call it quits. So now I'm going to trim the, the feather. And hackle's on, body's on. And all that's left is the hair. Now I am going to put a half pitch or two on here. Just a short little whip finish to save. I don't want that uh, hackle to pop off and unwind. You know, once flies 
hide, you can use a bodkin, preferably a different bodkin that doesn't have glue on it, and just kind of manipulate the fibers. That if you're not laying the way you want, you can kind of push them sometimes to make them do what you want. But that's fine. <clears throat> the way that is. Okay, now the deer hair. This is just a patch of regular natural colored hair. And it's not elk hair, it's deer hair. So it's probably an uh, inch to inch and a half long. I think this is from a Carolina deer, but it doesn't matter. It's any deer will do. And I'm, I'm going to demonstrate the use of a stacker. If you've never used a stacker, it's pretty simple, pretty simple concept. Let me see how I can do this for the camera here. So hmm. I'm just going to grab a bunch of hair. Maybe this, this is better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. So I'm just grabbing a bunch of hair off, you know, off of the, the swath here. And I'm just going to cut that whole thing off at the base, like so, all at once. How much would you say that is, John? Like the size of a match head, or um, smaller than a pencil, like a the size of a thin pencil. Cool, thanks. So when you when you cut this, it's there's going to be these long hairs, which are what we want, but there's also embedded in there, there a bunch of fine little hairs, like so. And if you just you pinch the pinch this end, this is the end we're going to tie on. Pinch those hairs and just very gently pull back. Uh, some of the finer hairs that we don't want will come out. You could also use a uh, like a brush or something to. You see that one that's sticking up there, the very fine one. You don't want those in there. So you just clean it off like this. And now I've got I don't know, maybe two dozen hairs or something there that are left. And you can see they're kind of all uneven ends and everything, right? So I've got I've got a couple of stackers here. This is the first one. It's a uh, like a cone and a, a little base, and it just fits in the cone fits in the base. Uh, the other stacker I've got is, is a metal stacker. It's a brass tube inside a it fits inside a metal tube. That's for longer hair and stuff. Um, depending on what you're doing, you could use one or the other. Well, the way these work. You take take the hair, and you just stick it uh, <clears throat> end down in the stacker. Yeah, like like so, and then using your fingers, kind of tamp it in there, and then you just basically wrap it on the. Um, let me show you here. Just tap it like that. When you, as you tap it, the hairs will even out and they'll in the in the stacker. So I'm just wrapping it down here on the top of my desk. And now when I am ready to uh, pull them out, so I remove the cone from the, the thing, the hairs are all more or less aligned. And now I've got my bundle that I'm going to be tying in there. How's that? Yeah, so now you can see the, uh, the ends are closer together. There's still a few stray ones, but it doesn't matter. Um, and I see a few other hairs I don't want. I'm just going to continue to 
kind of preen that a little bit. All right, and now I'm, now I'm ready to tie this in. Uh, like any deer hair, the first wrap should be a light one. And I'm going to measure it so the one thing you don't want to do is have to trim the back end of this um, and lose those nice natural tapers. So I'm going to hold it over the from the over the my fingers are over the eye of the hook. And I'm just going to look at the back end here and get it, you know, sticking out towards just over the, the bend of the hook. And when I get it the right length, now I'm going to switch my grip. Right now it's in my right hand, which is my thread hand. I'm going to switch my grip to the back. So I'm going to pinch over the hair and the back of the hook at the same time. And now I'm going to let go up front. Okay, that's a critical part of this. Now I'm going to go over once with um, a soft wrap. And <clears throat> in fact, the way Clouser teaches us for his uh, minnows, if you go above the hook, go around the fibers only um, with the first first wrap which is what i've done here and then you can very slowly tighten that down if you tighten it real tight it's going to flare up you don't want it to flare so i'm going to leave it partially tight i'm going to take a couple more wraps not so tight not too, now i'm getting a little tighter i'm going to go another wrap go a little bit tighter and I think it's when I think it's um, kind of cinched in that other loose thread is sliding down to the front and we all can see that but and then I'm just going to lift up on a so at this point the, the back end is more or less how I want it I just got to lock in the thread and, and secure everything I'm going to lift everything up to toward the back, and now I've got the front of the hook exposed, right? I'm going to take a couple of wraps around there, one, two, three. Let that come forward again. And now I'm going to really crank down that one, two. You see the front is flaring a lot now, but the back not so much, which is what you want. And now I've, I'm, I'm just going to tie it off. I'm going to tie it off here. I'm not going to tie it off around the um, around the hair. And I'm just going to do a whip finish on there. One, two, three. I missed one, but it's okay. Three, four, five. So I, I got, I'm ready to finish the whip. You can see I've, I've got the loop in my finger. I'm just going to grab, like pinch, the, the eye of the hook. So when I pull it tight, the loop won't grab any hair or get anywhere it's not supposed to go. All right. So that knot is done. I'm cutting the excess thread. And the fly is basically done except for trimming. Now, <clears throat> a really excellent thing to have around when you're using deer hair is uh, a double-edged razor blade. These things, nobody, I don't think anybody uses them for shaving anymore, but they're really, really sharp. They're not uh, expensive and they cut deer hair like crazy. I use this for something else, so part of the edge is no good, but I think this is still. And you really, when you're cutting deer hair, you just barely touch it to the hair and it, and it cuts right through it. So you gotta be a little careful. I'm gonna cut away from the part that I wanna keep, obviously. I don't wanna have any mistakes there. Try to do this so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm just, I've got the blade there and I'm just gonna cut that off. And the rest of it, I'm gonna trim a little bit here.
And um, <clears throat> so the fly is basically done. I'm, I'm just going to rotate it around and I'm going to check for proportions and stray hairs and stuff. This is looking at the underside of the fly. You can look at it from one side, you roll it over, you can look at the other side, look at it from the top and make sure that the, the wings are on, are not leaning to one side or anything. I'm going to try to rotate the whole wing thing, all the hair and everything, just twisting a little bit. There, that's that's pretty good. All right, I'm pretty happy with that fly. Now, a couple, two things to finish it. One thing you'll notice is, you know, I said it was a black caddis, but it, in in reality, it's got a tan wing. So, what do you do about that? Well, there's an easy, easy fix. Oh, So that, sorry about that. So the easy fix is you just take a black magic marker and color the wing. Um, my black marker's upstairs. So I'm not gonna run up and get it. I'm just gonna use this uh, dark umber marker that I have here, but the principle is the same. You just uh, apply the marker directly to the deer hair. And actually, when you apply black marker to this kind of deer hair, it doesn't turn it black. It turns it like a really nice charcoal gray color, which is a really good match for the for the bugs. This isn't looking. That's not the right color, but you get the idea. And um, It saves you the hassle of, you know, having to dye the deer hair and get it the exact color and all of that. Um, and then one last thing to, to finish, uh, finish this off is I'm going to put uh, a little bit of cement on here. Here I'm, I'm going to use the, uh, the blade again. This time I'm going to use it to clean the other glue off the, the bodkin. So I have a small, nice, clean needle to apply that glue with. Yeah. You can see how you go through uh, go through a few of these blades. All right, here comes the uh, glue. I've got just a little bit on there, and it's going right in on the thread, nowhere else. I'm just going to work it around a little bit. And I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. I'm not going to try to put any more on there. A little bit of thread, I think, or a little bit of glue, I think, uh, helps keep the, keep the hackle from coming unrolled after a fish or two. Um, you know, it's really... <laughs> It's really a bummer when you you find a fly and the fish are all over it, and after a couple of fish, the hackle unwinds, and then you're you got nothing. So um, a little bit of glue will will let you catch a few more fish before the fly falls apart. Anyway, so there's the first fly, deer hair caddis, three materials, really good fish catcher, and you can see that the um, because of the way the hackle is on here. It's palmered all the way up. It's going to help support that fly on the water and allow you to um, give it a little motion and, and move it around um, and look like the real thing. The real caddis are very, very active. They you know, sometimes just go straight up out of the water or sometimes they bounce on the surface. All right, fly number one. Any questions? Uh, yeah, Dick here, John. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Yeah, is there any reason you use deer hair and not elk hair? One is um, it's easier to come by. 
I mean, somebody gave me, I asked them, a friend of mine for some deer hair and he gave me like a gallon bag full of <laughs> pieces, right? So, okay. That's one now, reason. The other is, uh, it's a little bit bigger. And I'm tying these on size 14, whereas elk hair is, is finer. And it's, I think if I were using primarily 16 and 18 and even 20, size 20 flies, I would probably use elk hair. Um, but for the bigger size flies that I, I think are good for Cayuta Creek, um, I think I don't see any disadvantages of using the deer hair. All right, most of the elk hair caddis patterns that I've tied have been brown. I've never tried the black. I know there's probably black caddis, but I've had really good luck on the tan caddis. Right, I mean, there, there are many, many species of caddis, um, especially in the fall, the, the autumn caddis are brown or tan, kind of a tan, light brown color, but in the springtime, one of the most prolific hatches that we get is the black caddis. Oh. So I'm not saying you, you know, don't, I'm not saying use that black caddis year round, but in the spring during the Hendrickson time, right. that's when you're going to see them in, in big numbers. Well, that's right. good to, that's good to know. I've never tried the black caddis in the early season, but Good, good point. Thanks, John. Sure. All right. Uh, line number two in this caddis series is the sparkling merger. This is a pattern that was um, developed by Gary LaFontaine, who was uh, a guy that I admire a lot. He, he was curious about what fish see underwater that triggers them to feed. So he got some scuba gear and spent many hours laying in a trout stream watching the trout making observations about bugs and the trout and he developed some flies as a result of all that research and one of the things he one of the theories he came up with is that the caddis flies emit gas within their shuck it helps them float up to the surface and while they're floating up is when the trout eat them. And the main characteristic of the insect at that stage is a shiny, they have a shiny bubble because their, their, their shuck is filled with gas. And so he developed a, a couple of fly patterns to create that shimmery bubble uh, look. I've lost my, uh, my hook again here. That's not good. And the, uh, so the, the sparkle emerger, uh, it's called the ESP, Emergent Sparkle Emerger, or, uh, ESP, Emergent Sparkle Pupa is the official name of the fly. And uh, the antron yarn is tied in a bubble around the, the hook, and that's what gives it the uh, shimmery appearance. So I'm going to start this with uh, black thread. Going to the back as as before. And I'm using um, Antron yarn. It comes on a card like this. And uh, it's kind of a tan color. Um, you can use white, actually. The, the color really doesn't come through very much once you um, once you put it on the hook. So I'm going to cut, you can see where it comes off and there. You can see where it comes off with little bends in it where it was wrapped around the card. So I'm going to use like one and a half of those lengths. It's probably inch and three quarters or two inches worth. So I've just cut that. The rubber band on my vice is failing here. Come on. There. Get up there. 
All right, uh, where was I? So I have the I have this yarn. Now it comes off in a in a strand, and it's pretty. Um, it's, it doesn't separate easily. It comes. It's kind of woven in in ways that you don't, and you don't want to use that much. I'm going to divide it in two. I'm going to use a bodkin for that. So just sticking my bodkin in the middle and pulling it apart. And then once I got it going, I'm going to uh, there. So I got half of it. You know, and if you're tying a bunch of these, just separate the thread, put the other half away, and you'll use it later. So All right, so just take the end and uh, tie it on. Don't use too many wraps. It's, you know, four, five, six. There. That will be enough. So the and the other trick is. Um, <clears throat> To get that all untangled, I'm going to use my my comb, which I think I put away over here. What was I saying about cleaning up your desk for these things? Anyway, I can't find it. So if you have your, your, your dubbing comb that you use, you can just comb this out and it will separate some of those hairs a little better. Uh, I'm gonna actually tie in the other half of that. Um, I don't think I have quite enough on here. So the other half of the strand I'm gonna tie in also. And it's okay if it builds up a little thickness there because that's going to be the body of the fly anyway. Oh, and I, I don't know if I mentioned, but this is a standard dry fly hook also. There. So you basically want that stuff, you know, in the back, out of the way. And we're just going to put some dubbing on here. Same dubbing as before. A little bit of wax on there. John, was that the same dubbing as before? Yes, yeah, same dubbing. Okay. Yep. And I, I, you know, I don't want a real buggy body here. It's going to be under the veil, so I'm not, I'm not letting the, the dubbing get real fuzzy on the thread. I'm, I'm wrapping it with my fingers, uh, you know, pretty tight on there. All right, now I'm going to just wrap that up, form a little body. It doesn't have to be, you know, perfectly segmented or anything. It's, it's going to be completely covered by the, the veil. Okay, now you see, I got like a big wad of dubbing on the end here. It's, if I wrap that all on here, it's going to make a big lump. So I'm just going to try to separate that out and pull some of it down and get rid of it. And then what's left, I'm just going to wrap back on the thread. Finish up there. Yeah, okay. All right, body done. I'm going to half hitch a couple times, lock the thread. All right, and now we're just going to put the veil on there. So on the, <clears throat> on the bottom of the fly, so the fly is upside down right now, so the bottom is this way, um, I'm going to put 
bundle of fibers on one side and a bundle of fibers on the other side. So I'm going to take this strand that's sticking up on top and split that in two. Best I can. And I'm just going to know how to show this. I'm just going to make a, a loop. And I'm not going to pull it super tight. I'm not going to make it hugely loopy. I'm just going to put it, uh, you know, make a loop and put a wrap over it, one or two. And then I'm going to switch, rotate the vise a little bit and go from the other side, make a loop the same way. And now I'm going to do the remainder on the top of the hook. And you see, I, I only put a couple of turns on the eye of the hook right now just to hold that material in place. And I'm kind of getting everything in position here. Okay, so now I've got got the antron in, in a, the proximate bubble shape, right? But it's it's bunchy and it's not, you know, not real good. So here's the trick to getting this looking better. Um, take a bodkin. Right here, take a bodkin. <laughs> and I'm just going to use the bodkin to, um, so I'm going to pull it Pull it tight, pretty tight. And if it gets too tight, I can loosen it back up by using the bodkin to like just put pressure back on it a little bit. And as I rotate around, I can see, oh, there's a flat spot. I'm going to puff that one out a little bit more. And you can also see it's it's not uniformly distributed around the hook. So I'm going to take my fingernail and I'm just going to push just behind the thread and just kind of try to rotate that material a little bit around the on the hook to get it a little better distributed. And you know you can play around with this for a long time to get it looking perfect if you want. Um, I think you, it definitely gets easier the more you do it. Um, the flies that you buy that are done this way look perfect. So there must be a way to do it that comes out really good. But this is what I found for my own, my own use that works pretty good. So I'm going to try to get that all tight now. And so on and so forth. So you're just doing a little adjustment, a little adjustment. And at some point you're going to say, oh, that looks fine. And I'm going to, so I'm going to quit here with the with the veil. It's not a perfect sphere, but it'll it'll catch fish. I'm going to lift this up and go in front of the material a couple of times. And that's just so when I reef down on it, it's not going to twist the uh, material all over the hook. All right, and I'm going to cut the rest of this off. And I'm going to put a couple of whips on here. I'm even going to put a little stock of glue on there.
All right, and then, so this pattern also gets a little bit of hair, but not as much as the, uh, the adult. So I'm gonna take a smaller little clump, fewer, uh, fewer hairs, but treatment's gonna be basically the same. I'm gonna uh, cut it off. Sinking, sinking down. Yeah. So I'm just gonna clean it. There's not a whole lot there. I'm gonna stick it in the stick it in the stacker. Back it. And if it comes out of the stacker like this, with the one stray one, don't worry, just get rid of it. Voila. All right, same deal. I'm going to put this on the top. I'm going to tie it. I'm not going to tie it as far back. This is representing a less mature stage slightly and the pattern calls for um, less hair and uh, shorter hair. So I'm going to go like so. Again, hold it in with my other hand, go over the top pretty loosely. And after the first couple wraps, I can get a little tighter. That looks good. And go in the front, a couple of wraps, and I'm going to finish it. And then I'm going to put a little couple of wraps on here just strictly for coloration, make the head black. And then I'm going to finish it over here. So, get that out of the way. There we go. One. Two. Three. And you can also use your razor blade to cut the thread if you want. Works well for that. So that's the second. This is the sparkle emerger. I didn't put any weight on the fly. Uh, there's not enough hackle and hair on it to actually float it. But if you fish it on a dry line, uh, you can swing it like a, like a, a soft hackle or a wet fly. And um, just let it kind of drift at the end of your line, fish it downstream. And you'd be amazed. Uh, it works very well. All right, slide number two. Any questions on that one? No? All right, I'm going to keep moving, keep her moving. Slide number three is the third caddis fly. This is the deep sparkle. Uh, pupa. So it's a, it can be a dry fly hook or it can be a nymph hook, doesn't matter. Um, this is going to be tied in a 14 also. This one has a head, a bead head. It can be a black head or a gold head. I, I favor black. Um, black thread, black dubbing. And um, again, it has a little bit of a veil, the same deal. And it has a little bit of a collar on it, okay? But this one is designed to fish deep. Let's see, I'm done with the deer hair. Let's 
So on this fly, I uh, oh, I tie these on merger hooks. And they're curved. Um, they're like a it says here, shrimp hook, whatever. Um, I don't know what the equivalents are for um, the other brands, but it's 2487 TMC. And they look like this. They're curved. And they don't have to be fine wire, of course, because they're going to sink. Um, now the, the flies that the eyes that I'm using on these are are black eyes. Um, I think they're just glass beads that I got somewhere. They're not particularly heavy. Um, they're not they're not metal, but they're heavy. You know they're fairly they add some weight. I'll say that. So I'm just going to get that out of there and try not to spill the rest of them. I'm just gonna put that on the hook. Put that on there. Right. Okay. So that's got a huge uh, hole in it. It's um, to get that to stick on the front of the hook. It can't come off, but it's it's got a big hole in it. I'm going to just lay on some a whole lot of thread on here. And then I'm going to do some more. I'm actually going to just cut that off now, finish it, whip it, cut it, and glue it. Too much. Oh, come on. There you go. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what happens. Got just a little too much thread on there and it wouldn't go. All right, that's that's more to my liking. Close, it's closer to the front where it should be. All right. I'm going to restart the thread behind the bead. And I'm going to go back a little ways. I'm actually going to add more weight on this um, with lead wire. And start it toward the back and wrap to the bead. And just break it off. I'm going to wrap over that again, the thread. All right. I'm I'm not too worried about what that looks like, but 
you know, I don't want anything sticking out too much. So. That's pretty good. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit different with this one. It's Antron yarn, but it's fluorescent. And uh, it's it's just white, right? What what was sold is bright white Antron yarn. I just have a black light here and I check all my materials to see what's fluorescent, what it isn't. And, uh, this stuff lights up really good. I don't know if it makes a difference, but uh, it makes, I like the way it looks. So for, <clears throat> we're gonna actually do this differently. We're not gonna make a veil on this fly. We're gonna use the Antron as a body wrap on the fly. So I'm gonna cut a little bit more on than I did for the, um, for the emerger. I'm gonna go like one, two, well, I wanna make sure I have enough. I'm gonna take three, uh, clip it in three, three card lengths. And I'm going to tie that in here. Right there. Okay, that's tied in good. And I'm just going to bring the thread forward, tie it a half hitch behind the head. And let that hang off of my folder there. Now, the fun part is this this becomes the body. Um, I'm just going to twist it a little bit, and I'm going to wrap it around the around the body and make it. Um, if you twist it right and uh, maintain the twist as you wrap. It'll be segmented. And I don't want to build it up too much. I'm going to just cut it right, stop it right there, wrap it, and boom. So now it's got this little, looks like a little grub, you know, um, it's got some segmentation to it. The black is showing through a little bit on in between each of the segments there. <clears throat> and just to dress it up a little bit, I'm gonna put a, a little bit of a collar on it. You don't have to do this, but this is a Creepy Crawly Ice Dub I got at a show or something made by Hairline. And it's kind of a sparkly, crinkly, um, you know, synthetic material. I'm not going to use very much. I just got a, a tuft here. And I'm just going to tie it loosely around the collar. And then I'm going to, You know, I tied it in one place. I'm going to tie in some more over here. And I'm going to tie a little more over here. I don't want anything to stick out too long and just go in for effect here. Yeah. I find it very helpful to rotate devices I trim so you can see the profile of the hairs as they stick up. But I, I like the way that looks. I'm going to stop and I'm just going to the whip finish right behind the, the bead, two, three, four, five, and pull it tight, cinch it down. Some people pull on their whip finish knots to the point and just break the thread off. 
uh, I, I don't do that. I, I prefer to cut it, I cinch it down, but then I cut it. I don't know, just uh, a little more control that way, I guess. So there's the fly. And um, it also imitates a caddis, but it's uh, at a very early stage. And it's just drifting along the bottom. I'm going to put a little bit of uh, a touch of cement and weight well on that, all that thread that I wound up over there around the head, and we're done. So, there. I'm just going to take a minute and get reorganized here. That. John, when you fish this, do you usually fish it in tandem? Say, if there's a caddis hatch going on, will you make this your point fly and fish it down deeper and have like your sparkle pupa higher? Or? Typically, I don't do that um, because I, I don't want to tie anything, have anything hanging off of the emerger or the dry fly that's going to impede the action. Um, these I, I'll fish like, if I think it's, if, if I know, like if say I was out the day before and I know the black caddis are around, or you see them sometimes in the bushes on leaves and stuff, you know they're out there, they're hatching, but there isn't a hatch going on right now. Then I'll put this on, you know, I might, um, I'll, I'll put it on with an indicator basically and just, uh, you know, nymph it, but not fish it as a, a dry dropper kind of thing during the hatch. You know, I just, the idea is you fish this before the hatch. Right. Or before the hatch becomes visible because the way these bugs work is they emerge and then they leave their little house that they build and they drift along the bottom while they're inflating their, uh, mm -hmm you know, their body with gas. And then eventually they, they get to a point where they pop up out of the water. But there's a period of several hours, you know, before the hatch when they're drifting along the bottom and you can't see them. And that's what this bug was, this pattern was developed by LaFontaine for, for that part of the hatch. But once- yeah, Jen, Jen, can I ask the question on on the uh, bead, is there any advantage to you using maybe a tungsten bead, not wrapping the lead, or? It'd probably be the right thing to do, yeah. Um, and if you have tungsten beads, uh, you know, already, then sure, go ahead and use it. So I, I, don't, I, I don't think the sink rate would be much different you know, wrapping tungsten or lead versus tungsten. They both get down there. So, and also, John, look, it, the body and front to me looks white. Is that white or a light gray? So this, this is white, um, but when it gets wet and, and you, um, it's in the sunlight, I don't know if you can see this. I just wetted it. Oh, okay. So now it's wet and it's it's uh it's more translucent when it's wet. It's look it looks more glue uh like a, a gray. Well to me it's it's like a light gray, it's dull now. Yeah, and you can see the black coming through because it's it's become more it, you know, they, they say it's a white color, but it's really almost transparent. Okay. Um, it's just white because it's reflecting a lot of light. And, you know, you can, you can tie it with tan if you want, but if you're ever on Cayuta and probably Pohokan too, and you look, look at your feet, you'll notice there are a million of the, what, what we, when we were kids, we called them stick bugs, right? It's, it's these big caddis that make, homes out of 
sticks that are the size of matchsticks. And they glue them, you know, five or six of them in parallel. And they, they live on the inside of those. Right, I've seen those, yes. Yeah, and so if you take one of those and you peel it apart and look on and see what's inside, it looks a lot like this. Right. And the, body, I, of, the body of the grub is kind of a off-white, dull tan. I have of, seen a few green, but mainly they've been in Pennsylvania. Right, the green caddis are the ones that live, uh, they're called rich richophilia. They live uh, attached to rocks. And um, so you could, you could tie this with green and I, I actually do that. I tie some with green uh, yarn to mimic those other species of, of uh, caddis. So. Um, Very good, you know, thank you. It's, it's something different from your typical, you know, when people are, are getting into nymphing and they're starting out, they're like, well, I'm gonna use a hair's ear, or I'm gonna use a, a prince, or I'm gonna use a, um, pheasant tail, right? Because those, the, those are the most common mayfly nymph imitations. Well, this is a easy to tie uh, caddis nymph, if you will, really a pupa, but it serves that same purpose. So, um, and you can tie it in a variety of colors and sizes and so forth. Okay. All right. Um, hey, hey, John. Yeah. What, what was the name of that fly? I didn't catch it. Is it just called a caddis pupa or what? So <clears throat> the, uh, the official name is La Fontaine's Deep Sparkle Emerger, I think. Deep Sparkle Pupa, DSP. Deep Sparkle Pupa, yeah. D yes. Okay, thank you. La Fontaine, it's L-A-F-O-N-T-A-I-N-E. La Fontaine, Gary La Fontaine is his name. He, he wrote a wonderful book called Caddisflies where he detailed all things of his underwater observations and how to tie these patterns and and so forth. So so this one is the this is the deep sparkle emerge or it's not an emerger, it's deep sparkled pupa. And then the, the, the emerger is called the sparkle emerger. Well he he actually called he was kind of a funny guy. He called it the Emergent Sparkle Pupa, so the acronym is ESP, right? But if you if you look up, if you do a Google search on La Fontaine Caddisflies, these will come up. There's actually a YouTube somewhere that somebody put up of Gary Gary La Fontaine tying these flies and talking talking how to tie them. Um, I mean, and it was an old video because it was from like 1985 or something. But I was I was thrilled to, to see it. All right, I'm gonna. Hey, hey, John. Yeah. Oh, hi, Kirk. Yeah. Hey, how are you doing, buddy? Good. The uh, camera's looking great, by by the way. Good. And the, and, and and the setup with you on the side is is just fantastic. No, I had a chance to uh, meet Gary Lafontaine and see him uh, tie an ESP up at uh, the Syracuse one fly. Mm. Wow. And that was that was a real moment because uh, that was the first time I met uh, both Gary and Lefty Craig. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Two, uh, two luminaries. Um, and and the ESP for me is is a great pattern um, that I use often um, in a caddis hatch, I'll trail it behind a um, an elk hair caddis. Mm -hmm. um, right. If I can't figure out which, then I'll just do a like a dry dropper, and and that uh, ESP is a pistol to see. So the spotter fly is real helpful, um, but but uh, for yeah. me that's that's very it's a it's a very lethal fly. 
Yeah, and I, I agree. Yeah, I would I would fish it the two of them in combination because they're both going to fish at or near the surface. Mm -hmm. and, and and it's okay if they move around a little bit. Um, yeah, it doesn't hurt anything. All right, um, I'm going to attempt to do two more flies. I got about 45 minutes or so. Well, not even. And I, th I think I'm going to do the sunken stone first because it's. I think it's for me. It's more of a favorite fly and a little more unusual. And then if I can, I'll get to the uh, skittering stone. Also, but this this sunken stone fly is a pattern that I developed based on soft tackles and based on something Joe Cambridge said about using plastic for a wing. I think he was talking about a midge at the time, but I went ahead and put it on a, a basically a stone fly body and wrapped some soft tackle around it and it worked. So these are um, TMC hundreds. And uh, I'm tying this a little bigger. I'm just tying it on a size 10. You know, stoneflies come in a lot of different sizes. And uh, 10 is probably the biggest. I would tie this in a, anywhere from a 10, 12, to down to 14. But for the purposes of demonstration, I decided to go a little bigger with it. And uh, I need to get focused here. Raise my chair. Come on. Focus. Hopefully it'll kick in. So for this, I'm going to start with, again, I'm using black thread. Come on, focus. And here's my cup. And you know, for Cuta Creek, this could be tied in yellow as well, because there's uh, good good numbers of uh, yellow stoneflies uh, that come out in June, and uh, works for them too. So yellow or black, you know, as you wish, but I don't mix them. All right, so I got my thread on here. I am going to put a little weight on this fly. You don't. You don't really want to fish it in the surface or the film. It's, but I, you know, it's it's fished it's swinging. But um, you know, if it's six, six or twelve inches below the surface, that's fine. So there's my my thread. This is very fine thread, so I'm going to go back and back over it. Uh, did I say thread? Very fine uh, lead wire. Ah. All right. So I've got some lead on there. All right, so I need my soft tackle, which is, as I said um, in my first, first time here, this is Marie's chicken soft tackle that somebody gave me. And I haven't run out yet. So it's got uh, it's got quite a few feathers. Uh, so this is this is what I'm looking at when I'm selecting my soft tackle. I'm just looking for a little feather about the size of my thumbnail, where the barbs are not too long. And you don't have to have that much usable feather either. I mean, you basically want to make legs on the fly with it. So um, it doesn't have to have that much usable material. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with this. The stuff on the back, of course, is no good. So that's gotta come off. 
I'm just going to strip that off like so. All right, yeah, I think that's going to work. All right, I'm going to tie that in by the tip at the back of the hook. Not too many wraps, four or five. And because Hackle likes to come undone and, and basically ruin fly, I'm going to put a tad of glue on there. And I've got to get my magnifier on here. Now, you remember what I said last time? The best way to ruin a bobbin is to put a dab of glue right there and have it run down the thread right into the top of the bobbin. So, when I get ready to drop the thread or the, the glue on there, I'm going to move the bobbin. I'm just going to hold that off to the side. With my finger, and then that's all I need. All right, we got that. Now I'm going to put. Oh, no. I'm going to put the uh, body on there, and this is a black fly, so I'm going to use black dubbing. And I don't want to use dry fly dubbing. I happen to have a bag full of uh, nymph dubbing. So I will get something out of there. This is a Hairtron 12 most popular colors. And I've had to restock the black a few times, but maybe a few others. Anyway, it's basically, I think it's basically rabbit with some synthetic mixed in. Uh, it's nothing too, too special. I mean, the main thing is it it'll make a little buggier fly, and it also it's okay if it absorbs water. It's not going to hurt anything. All right, so I got my thread with the uh, dubbing on it, and I'm just going to wrap the body. Just enough to cover the. Um, lead and I didn't put enough on there. That's not a problem. Wrap it up. Again, I'm I'm going to stop a little in front of the by the hook. I don't want to get too close. And the way this dubbing worked out, it's kind of bulky and and bunchy. So I'm going to go back with the thread and just kind of work down some of the bigger bumps. Add a little bit more of a segmented look, maybe. And I'm going to stop right there. Put a half inch in. All right. Now, I guess you can see that pretty good. There's, there's a lot of long hairs, fibers coming off the body right now. And, you know, for some flies, that's fine, but I don't really want that. <clears throat> Um, 
I don't really want that on this fly. So I'm going to take my scissors and just cut those off. So we have a kind of a more compact body. Yep. All right, and now all I need to do is wrap this, uh, wrap the legs up, taking my radio shack. Now, I want the curve of the feather to point backwards, so I'm just gonna twist it a little bit. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to make it all the way to the front with these legs. So I'm gonna take really wide turns. I may not have enough. Yeah, I can even make like hardly. But you know what? I think it's gonna be fine. I'm just gonna go back a little bit. Make sure I got that stem locked down pretty good before I cut it. I'm gonna cut it now. All right, now it kind of looks like a mess, but I think it's okay. I'm gonna take my, my little um, Velcro brush made out of a toothbrush and some Velcro and just brush down. See what I can develop here, likewise. Those are pointing the wrong way. So I'm gonna I'm gonna actually grab those fibers and push them back the way I want them to go, which is back toward the back end. And go back and put a wrap on them. There we go. Okay. All right, that's pretty messy. It's not ideal. Uh, I could do a better job with a longer feather, but I would still fish that fly. And <clears throat> it'll look a lot better when I put the wing on. So the wing, it's going to be made out of this piece of plastic. This particular strip here has very fine cross hatching on it. It is um, from a sandwich bag of some kind. Um, I, I've also tied them with just plain clear um, plastic strips from sandwich bags. I don't think it makes any difference to the fish, but I like the way they come out. So, and actually the, the width of the, the strip here is about the length of the, the wing that I want. You can see if I hold it up this way. So I'm gonna actually cut the wing from the strip this, this way. I'm gonna do that right now. So I have a, a strip right now and it's um, maybe a quarter inch wide at the widest, maybe not even that much. It tapers down a little bit. I'm gonna taper the front more using my scissors here. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna check the width, the length rather. That's pretty good actually. It's a little bit beyond the bend of the hook. And if you've seen stoneflies in the, in the real, uh, in the wild, the uh, wings lay down flat along their back. Kind of like that. So I, what I've done is I put a crease in this down the middle and um, I, now I'm gonna, I'm just gonna trim the ends Oh, oh, oh. 
again. Got lucky on that one. Oh, third time. Okay. You know, and, and again, it's probably not even necessary to trim it and try to make it round and all that, but part of the fun. Yeah, good enough. Okay. okay, so there's my wing. It's trimmed. It's the right length. I got it folded over and I'm just going to tie it in over the top, uh, starting right behind the hook, right behind the hook eye. I'm laying it down and I'm going to wrap over and make a head at the same time. And I got to make sure the thread doesn't slide off of the plastic. So once I get it, a purchase on there on the plastic, I'm going to cinch down quite hard. And I see I trapped a, a leg here, so I'm going to take my bodkin and just tease that leg out before I get too far. Put them out of the way. All right, now I'm going to build the head. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm cinching down the plastic here, the wing. But at the same time, I'm actually building a little black head on the fly, just for, for looks. And that looks pretty good. I'm just going to tie it off. One, two, three, four, five. So there's the finished fly. Pop that leg again. Okay. You know, it, it'll fish fine like that. I, I would probably trim the legs to the bottom of the hook, like so. At least some of them. But that's that's what it looks like. Not your typical soft tackle, but uh, you fish it like one, just let it swing. And because it's weighted, it'll it'll take your leader down a few inches. And you know, uh, some stone flies run across the top of the water when they hatch, and others crawl to the edge and, and emerge, and others kind of are in between. And uh, so the trout see them in all different places and positions, uh, which is why I think you can you can fish this on the swing and did, did water column and catch fish on it. And uh, I, I am going to put a little zappy gap on here. John, what was the hackle on that again? I missed that part. It's just um, my standard soft hackle hackle. Okay. Which is it's just a, a chicken skin that somebody gave me. Okay. That happens to be a really nice gray color. You could use starling as long as it's not too small. Uh, you could probably use pheasant. I wouldn't, I mean, pheasant is mostly tan or, or brown. I would go with something gray or black. Um, But any, you know, anything you would use on a soft tackle fly, you, you could use for that. All right, um, questions? If not, I'm, I'm gonna press ahead. I got one more to go and it's not that difficult, so. So this one, This is the, what I call the skittering stone fly or the Cayuta special. Uh, it's the Cayuta special is actually the one that I tie for the yellow stone fly hatch. 
which is uh, June, the June thing. You know, it's the best days I've had on Peter on the Yellowstone flies are, you know, it starts out cool in the morning, like in the 55 degrees. And by noon, it's, you know, 75, 80. And that in between time, yellow stone flies would be crawling. They crawl to the edge of the stream and crawl out on the rocks and the trout go right to the edge of the stream and pick them off. And, and again, they're, they're an active insect when they're emerging. So they, um, if you dead drift it, they won't take it. You have to move the fly, to get them you know, to believe it. And, uh, and that's really what makes it so much fun is you can, you can plop it out there and then twitch it and twitch it and the fish will, you know, you can, if the water's clear, you can just watch the fish key in on it and come over and grab it. Uh, there's nothing more fun than that. So again, it's just the standard dry fly hook. PNC 100 or thereabouts. And um, I'm going to tie the yellow variety here as best I can. I don't actually have any correctly colored uh, tackle, but you'll get the idea. I'm starting out with some yellow thread. Again, this is a very simple fly. There's not a lot of materials here. I got my um, thread on. Then I need to put on the, the hackle and the dubbing. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. So because you want this fly to really float well, um, I also put a tail on it, a hackle tail. And for that, you want a little bit longer fibers. Which I won't really have here. So I'm just going to dig something out of here. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on, I should have done this earlier. So for for to hackle for the tail, I'm going to use long fibers. These are too, you know, these are too webby. They're not dry fly. They're not stiff. Those will probably work. Well, too short, but better than nothing. All right. Um, yeah, so I've got, I don't know, six, eight fibers on there. Those are barbs from the dry fly feather sticking out the back. And I know they're going to fall off if I don't glue them something. Okay, now the, the thing with this fly is you want it to float really high. Um, just dance on the tips of the hackle. So I put two hackle feathers on it. Um, double hackle it. This is um, a grizzly, kind of a brown and white grizzly. The preference would be uh, a yellow for the yellow stonefly. And you could mix it one yellow and one grizzly. Um, I didn't find any yellow in my collection, so I'm not using that. But again, you so to measure this out for size, you know, I'm spreading spreading the barbs and then 
looking looking at where they are relating to the, the bottom of the hook, they're well below it. And that's actually what you want for this fly. Um, so this is a good size right here. I'm gonna tie it in from the back. And there's you know, multiple ways to do this. I find this easy for me to, to do. I'm also going to have a different fly, a different hackle. This is a black and you know natural grizzly hackle. Again, it's pretty darn long. Um, maybe even be, yeah, that's good. So I'm going to tie that in pretty much right on top of the other one. So I got yeah. and I'm going to glue it again. Right. All right, that's half of it. Uh, the other half is dry fly dubbing. I'm going to wax on my string here, my thread. Not very much. I'll take so this is um, again just basic dry fly dubbing. Super fine pine wood flies. It's kind of a pale, pale yellow color. You know, and the best the best thing to do is it, once you you go out and you find a couple of these yellow stones in the Cohocton or the Denny or the, you know, nowadays everybody has a camera with them. So take a picture of it or two, and then you can see what color they, your flies need to be. And uh, go from there. Some of them are bright yellow and some are more of a dull pale. I'm tying this in the tail. So I'm not doing anything fancy here, but I'm filling it, trying to build a body with some some substance. So I'm. If, it, if, it, if one wrap is too thin, I'm just wrapping a couple of times to even things up. I need to add a little more dubbing. It's not a problem. Just keep adding it. All right, and that's about as much as I want to do. So, that's all excess. All right.
So all we need to do is wrap the hackle. And, and so, you know, the, the technique here is called palmering. It basically means you're starting at the back and wrapping the hackle all the way up the length of the hook shank um, from one end to the other in concentric wraps. And I'm going to start it, you know, without rotating the vise. You can see as you go, you can um, manipulate the uh, fibers and try to get them laying in the right direction. You basically want them sticking straight up and down. All right. Not bad. And now I'm just going to use the vise. Rotate this around. I'm going very slowly here, and I'm, you know, if the fibers start to go flat or something, I'm just pushing them, getting them to lay upright the way I want them to. You can hold them with this, you know, your index finger and your thumb, and use your middle finger to get them to, to lay the right, right way. If you want. That's about, I'm almost at the end of the, the eye there. So I'm gonna, so at this point, I just have one wrap and I, I'm holding the tension with my thumb. Um, and, you know, I haven't cut the end of the hackle. And it's important to keep that tension at this point. And I, you know, had to recover a little thread in the bottom. I'm going to go a couple more wraps behind. And get that thread over the both of the uh, stems. And then I, once I've done about three, three or four wraps on one side, I'll hold them to the other side and do a few a couple wraps. All right, and now I feel like it's the hackle is pretty secure, I'm going to cut the stems. Get them out of the way. And just to finish it, I'm going to whip, put a whip finish on the front. You don't really have to build a head on the fly if you don't want to. Um, If I just build a little small little head on there and my thread broke up the knot, that's fine. And I'm going to finish it with a drop of glue. And I deliberately got a little in the eye there. I'm just going to show you. Um, I think I showed this in the first session, but I'm going to, in case you missed it, when you get, um, if you're using glue or head cement and you get some in the eye of your hook, like I just did, if you leave it there, it'll un end up. <clears throat> being the fly you pull out when you're in a big hurry and the fish are hatching all over the place and you can't get your tippet through the fly and then you fumble around for the the correct nippers that have the little pin that'll let you get the glue out but then the pin is too big so then you have to get another fly out you use the point of the hook push the glue out of the eye so you can avoid all of that you take a hackle feather strip it strip it and you know, leave leave a little bit on the end here, a few a few uh, you know inch or so on the end, and strip the rest of the stem. And you stick that in the eye while the glue is still wet. Key key point there. I talked too much. Get that in the eye and just run it down through one time. And it'll take all the glue out.
I have a little collection of feathers over there for just that purpose. All right, um, so that's basically a skittering stone. I don't like that one fiber sticking out. I'm just going to trim it. Now on this one, you know, the, when you're all done, it, it, <clears throat> you know, it looks pretty good, but definitely inspect the fly from the front and see how the fibers are aligned. It should be a nice, nice concentric pattern there. And look at it this way. There should be a lot of, uh, you know, up and down fibers, not too many skewed one way or the other. And you can kind of um, manipulate it a little bit with your, not your bodkin, the clean one, not the one you put glue on. Um, just kind of move stuff around. It's not how you want it. Some of these are laying down flat. I'm just going to push behind the fibers a little bit. Maybe some of them will stand up a little more. So that's that's basically the done fly right there. And uh, you know the cool thing about this one is is um, how can I show this? You know, it when it floats on the water, it's there's hardly anything touching the water there, right? It's it's just just resting on the hackle tips. Do you fish that dead drift or do you try to have it skitter across and part action on it like you'd see a stonefly skittering? No, I you definitely skitter it. Yeah. Um, you don't have to, I mean, you you could dead drift it for a little bit and then um, give it a twitch or you know move it a little bit. If it um if you if you put it down on a flat surface and it keeps where am I here? If you put it on a flat surface like your your uh, your bench or your um, you know, whatever, and it wants to tip forward like so all the time, or tip over like that. Um, you can actually take the hack, take the uh, take your scissors and trim the bottom, make it a little flatter. So instead of a rounded um, rounded bottom, your hackle's kind of flat. And, and when you do that, it, um, it just helps it um, sit on the water, you know, nice and sturdily. And it still skitters just fine, but it, it helps it sit upright. So I have a little box of stone flies, you know, they're Half of them are skittering stones, and the other half are the sunken stones for swinging. And uh, I have some yellows and some blacks, and they're just part of my standard standard kit for around here. Um, I never never pass up an opportunity to fish them if, the, if I think they'll catch, because it's a fun way to fish. Okay, um, how about that? It's, uh, 8.57 and I tied five flies and I'm done. Nicely done. So any other questions or anybody wants to talk about general topics for a few minutes, I'm fine with that. I know it's been a long, a long evening probably. No, I thought it was great. Nice job, John. Thank you, Dick. Yeah, nice job, John. Thanks for camera. Like some pretty good flies. Yeah. The uh, I got a comment. The camera setup is a game changer. That was that was awesome. Being able to see you and then then seeing your flies in detail. That's uh, that's a, that was a great great setup. Yeah, I can even I can even see the hair on your chest, John. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> That's probably a bonus you didn't really need, you know. <laughs> but uh, like I said, my my chair keeps sliding down. I, I need to be <laughs> be up here like this. Yeah, no, I mean, and you know, from a from the point of view of the the presenter, 
this this is so easy to set up it's ridiculous you know you turn it on and you plug it in and, and it works yeah there's very very little setup to do compared to fiddling with third-party software and blah 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 you know that we were doing before so and you'll notice uh we went two hours and we only lost focus once mm -hmm. and it was very brief and the network never glitched out and so yeah uh, i think it was between kirk and matt and tc who researched all this and made it happen it's uh definitely worthwhile kirk and tc are the are the smees on the on the media stuff i'm still learning so it's all those yeah. guys but uh great Great job, John. And uh, you got me, caught my attention when you mentioned the soft tackle uh, stonefly there. So I'll be trying up some of those. And um, yeah, just, just a, a great kickstart to the tying season. Uh, yeah. Does anyone else have any questions for John before we adjourn for the uh, evening? Or? I'm just okay. curious who all's on here. Yeah, uh, why don't you stop uh, your share? Well, let me. Uh, yeah, let me do yeah, that. I'm just looking here. We got eight people. So I see Dick, I see Schaffler, I see somebody named George.